Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, it's all about slow-mo. Kyle Anderson, everything he brought to the Timberwolves about what some could argue was a career season in his first year in Minnesota. Why what he did was so important. The areas that he was best in, what he brought to the Wolves on both ends of the floor. We're going to break it all down on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked on Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Hump Day. The player review series rolls on today with slow-mo Kyle Anderson. First of all, a big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can download on Twitter at Locked on T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Uh, we're going through the player review series. We're into the Timberwolves, uh, really, the like six players that started the most games, you know, taking that finished the season with the team, obviously removing D'Angelo Russell from the mix. Um, so we did Mike Conley on Tuesday. Today we're doing Kyle Anderson and spending the whole show really breaking down his first season in Minnesota. I want to talk about both ends of the floor. I want to talk about his numbers compared to the rest of his career, his fit with the Wolves, some of the lineup data, what that tells us. And uh, we'll, we'll hit all those uh, points here today. Let's start with this. As a free agent signing, Kyle Anderson was everything that the Timberwolves were looking for and more. Um, I think pretty much universally, everybody loved the signing when the Timberwolves added him at, at a two-year, $18 million deal last summer. There's really nothing to to not like about it, right? I mean, this is a, a player who's been super consistent, four years in San Antonio, four years in Memphis, entering the prime of his career, really kind of the middle of the prime of his career. And the Wolves have pretty much always lacked players like Kyle Anderson, who are the, and I, I like seriously, pretty much always in franchise history. There've been only a handful of these guys who are, you know, uh, consistent veterans who are good on both ends of the floor, um, who essentially bring that same effort every single night could, could give you, and I talked about this a lot with Conley on Tuesday, that baseline of performance, not too high, not too low, the consistency, the professionalism, all those things. And, when there were nights when he was completely off or like when he had that stretch where he just got a bunch of technicals and you know, some of those things that was weird because that's felt a little bit out of character for Kyle Anderson. But by and large, he was just kind of a rock for the Timberwolves. Um, And maybe the best example of this, and it's, it's a very specific one, but like think of Kyle Anderson's uh, performance as a, as a zone beater for the Timberwolves this year, right? Like that's a very specific instance. And, um, you know, just one thing that I was going to talk about today anyway, but like Kyle Anderson, put him in the middle of the zone. He's going to pick apart the defense. He's going to slow things down. Um, keep you confident in your offense instead of rushing, you know, the first semi-open three-pointer you get or forcing a pass into the middle as D'Angelo Russell or, you know, Towns, if you had the ball in the perimeter would do against his own defense. Kyle Anderson could just post up right in the middle of the zone, not, really literally post up, but just be in the middle of the zone, like at the elbows, middle of the paint, take a pass, you know, turn and survey, not panic, hit Gobert in the dunker spot, hit Mike Conley outside the arc for three or whatever it is. Kyle Anderson essentially running the Wolves offense with uh, against the zone defense is a pretty good microcosm or example of what he is as a player for the Wolves. Calming everybody down playing at his own pace, as everybody loves to say, every single national broadcaster that has ever announced a Kyle Anderson game has just said, oh, he plays at his own pace. He slows the game down, whatever. That's 100% true, as cliche as it is. That's Kyle Anderson against his own defense. That's Kyle Anderson overall. And that's the element that he brought to the Timberwolves and a team that has that plays so fast. Uh, and, and Kyle Anderson can, quote unquote, play fast, as in push the pace, even if his nickname is slow mode. He himself is going to take his time with the ball in his hands. He can play part, obviously part of a team that plays at high pace like this Wolves team. 
But think about all the players on the Timberwolves who do want to play at a breakneck speed, whether it's Anthony Edwards or Jalen Noel or Carl Anthony Towns when he's got the ball in the open floor and Nas Reed. And Kyle Anderson is only slow-mo in the sense that he makes his own moves at his own pace, but he's not going to slow down your transition offense, right? It's not like, uh, it, but yet he brings his a sense of calm to the whole thing, right? In, in a different way than D'Angelo Russell. Like Chris Finch wants to run after makes. D'Angelo Russell didn't always want to run after makes. Kyle Anderson gets it. Like Kyle Anderson is going to play at whatever pace the team needs to play at. Um, and then within the half court is going to take his time, make the right decisions, et cetera. That's absolutely what he brings to the table. It's what the Timberwolves were looking for when they brought him in. Shooting wise, you could argue Kyle Anderson had the best shooting year of his career, certainly from outside the arc for his career before this season. Kyle Anderson was a 33.4% three point shooter this year, 41% in a Timberwolves uniform best in his career mark by almost eight full percentage points, which is pretty much unheard of for somebody who's what nine seasons into the league. Now um, he was just 33% last year in Memphis. Uh, now the volume was, was low. He only shot one and a half per game and teams were still daring him to shoot threes. And, and that became an issue, especially in the playoffs, uh, you know, close late games, like teams were, were not treating him like a typical 41% three point shooter. Because the volume was so, so low and everybody knew Kyle Anderson didn't really want to shoot threes. But I mean, shooting 41% is still a good thing, even if it doesn't have the same impact as as your typical 41% three point shooter. It, it was still but be obviously beneficial, right? You'd rather him shoot 41% than 33%. Um, almost half of his three point attempts came from the corners and he was almost 47% from the corners, 46.8%, which was his career best mark from the corners as well. Um, a couple years ago when he shot the ball fairly well from deep with Memphis, he was under 40% from the corners. Actually, three years ago, he was only 25% from the corners. That's steadily improved and now almost 47%, which that's still going to be where most of those looks are generated. And the Wolves don't really want him shooting above the break threes. He doesn't want to shoot him either. So if he finds himself in the corner because Towns or Gobert is operating in the middle of the floor and pick and roll, that's the spot for Kyle Anderson. And he can knock that down if he needs to. Um, so it's almost like when he's at the four, that's the type of thing that like the Wolves wanted Jared Vanderbilt to be able to do last year. And he did do a little bit this year in Utah and in LA, but um, you know, knock down one a game. Like when they dare you shoot one to two a game and make one a game, like that's, that's kind of the goal um, to, to keep them honest, to be there, to be able to knock down that shot when it's there for you, you're not going to search for it. You're not going to run a play to get that shot. Right. Uh, but you'll, when, when you get it, you'll take it. And hopefully you make it 40% of the time. And that's what Kyle Anderson did this year. Overall, his shooting numbers, um, this was his second best season in terms of effective field goal percentage. And of course, effective field goal percentage um, just adjust for the for three-pointers, uh, basically. So it's better than looking at raw field goal percentage and three-point effective field goal percentage. He had he had a was it his last season or his first season in Memphis? He had a 56% effective field goal percentage. That was only a half season. He was injured that year, only played 43 games. So a smaller sample this year, 55.3% effective field goal percentage. This was the best true shooting percentage season of his career. Um, and you know, that, that paints a similar picture, right? That also takes into account free throws. Um, so it's maybe the best all encompassing stat and, and it narrowly beat out his last year in San Antonio, but 58.3% true shooting, um, for Kyle Anderson, which uh, like the Wolves will take that. Like it's a happy surprise to be able to get that much offensive production. I should say efficient offensive production from Kyle Anderson. Um, like it's, it's, that's not what you're, what you're looking for from it. It's still not a great mark overall, like for somebody who's going to, to, you know, use a high number of possessions, but he's not using a high number of possessions. It was his lowest usage rate since his second year in Memphis um, and pretty in line with his career mark, actually just slightly below where he's been at for his career in terms of usage rate. So that all makes sense. Um, you know, if, if we, if we break down his season specifically related to his, his shooting numbers, I want to talk about a couple of areas that he also had career highs in, in addition to three point shooting, I want to talk about, uh, his defensive impact, um, dig into a little bit of the B ball index numbers, what those say, and then also the lineup data. So we'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. We've all been there. We've all waited till the last minute to buy tickets to whatever event we're trying to go to. For me, it's oftentimes sporting events, occasionally concerts. 
um, comedy shows, et cetera. And it's, it's not fun to be scrambling at the last minute, but that is not what you should be you, that you should have to do. Not with game time. Game time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Get images of your seats before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. A big thank you once again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Every day as we continue the player review series tomorrow. That's Thursday. And uh, we'll talk about Rudy Gobert on Thursday. We're basically doing this by minutes played. So we'll do Gobert Thursday. Jade McDaniels Friday. Next week we'll get to Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards. Obviously with Towns I'm fudging it a bit because Towns and Edwards are the Timberwolves' best two players. So we'll do them next week. Um, and then uh, shooting for a very exciting show. I think... Uh, latter part of next week a, a very um exciting guest to have on the program to talk timberwolves for a bit of a national perspective so uh we'll announce that when we get a bit closer once that gets 100 percent confirmed but shooting for that to be late next week as well so a lot upcoming on the show we're still daily monday through friday so make sure to uh, follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts all right kyle anderson we talked about him offensively his shooting numbers we talked about him as a zone beater Along with that, along with the role he played, because, you know, how many times there were some teams, especially early mid season that ran the zone a ton against the Wolves because it worked until Kyle Anderson kind of was put into that role. But like if he wasn't on the floor, if he was, you know, injured, missed the game, whatever teams would run more zone and, and teams that like to play a lot of zone did it really well against the Wolves. That's still only a, you know, relatively uh, small number of possessions. But it still contributed to a career best assist rate for Kyle Anderson. He had an assist rate of 22.6%, which is over four points better than his next best career assist rate. And if you want to just look at the raw, like traditional assist per game, 4.9 per game, his previous career best was 3.6. So nearly an assist and a half more per game. That was two years ago in Memphis. Um, and only twice in his career has he ha averaged three or more assists per game. He was nearly at five per game this season. It wasn't just the zone thing either. Like that contributed to it, certainly. But it was also, he was effectively the Timberwolves backup point guard for long swaths of the season. When Jordan McLaughlin was out with the injury, when he was ineffective, um, it was Jalen Noel and it was Kyle Anderson and it was Anthony Edwards kind of splitting those second team initiation, offensive initiation duties. And Slomo was by far the best of the of that trio. A 22.6 assist rate by far a career high, and yet the turnover rate was not super out of whack. Um, it was it was not the highest of his career. It was like third highest or something. But typically when you see the assist rate rise so much, it's because they're running the offense, and you also naturally see the turnover rate rise. That did not happen with Kyle Anderson. It was it was up from last year, but that's it wasn't up from like a few other seasons in his career. It wasn't completely, like I said, not completely out of whack or out of line with what he's done in the past. You can handle a t almost a 23% assist rate with a 16% turnover rate. That's not a big deal. Um, and his usage rate was, again, only a little over 14%. So what that means is he's initiating offense in a really smart way, a really deliberate way, again, slow-mo. Um, and that was big. The Wolves didn't have a, a reliable backup point guard. When Jordan McLaughlin got hurt, they didn't bring in a point guard. Like, a couple years ago, McKinley Wright was on a two-way. They barely used him in a third point guard role. They actually used Jalen Noel far more often. Um, you know, you go back further. Teams traditionally have three point guards. You have a guy who could come in and run the offense. The Wolves just said, you know what? Screw a typical roster construction. We're going to go into the season with a couple max players at center. We're going to go into the season with, um, you know, some mixture of guys as our third string point guard if something happens to McLaughlin or D'Angelo Russell. Well, something happened to McLaughlin, and the Wolves never – corrected anything they didn't even have a, a two-way player that was a point guard like every other season i think if i'm not mistaken going back to 
you know, what's his name that Tom Thibodeau brought in the guy from Rhode Island. Um, I keep wanting to say Jared Richmond. It's not Jared Richmond. I'm blanking. On, obviously not Jared Richmond. I am blanking on his name. Uh, but like there was always a guy who could at least play point guard, even if it was more of a scoring guard. Like that was the idea is you have an emergency two way guy that could come in and play point. The Wolves were like, no, nah, we can use Jalen. Noel. we can use Kyle Anderson. We can use Anthony Edwards to run this third team or second team offense as the quote unquote third point guard. It ended up basically being Kyle Anderson. And then later in the season when McLaughlin was struggling after he returned from the calf injury and in the playoffs, McLaughlin only played in two of the five playoff games and was pretty bad. Um, Kyle Anderson was the guy. He ran the offense and he did a good job. Like he was pressed into that duty and did a really good job. The other thing positionally, he didn't play very much small ball center. He did a ton of that in Memphis the last couple of seasons and very rarely played the five with the Wolves this year. And that's obviously because you had, um, you know, obviously injuries kind of impacted who was available, but you had Rudy, you had Towns, you had Nas, um, and Garza, and Nate Knight all played heavy minutes at the five. So Kyle Anderson did it very sparingly, but it, like he is also like, he has the ability to do that if you need him to. And again, he did that a ton with the Grizzlies, especially the last couple of seasons um, due to Jaron Jackson, junior injuries and things like that in Memphis. Um, the other thing that's notable with Kyle and I think is somewhat related to him not playing small ball five is a career low rebound rate. And I've been beating this over the head with a bunch of these guys like Tory Pritz had a career low rebound rate. Um, the wolves just have had an issue with rebounding, especially in the defensive glass for years. And Kyle Anderson, unfortunately was part of that problem this year. Now, again, part of it is because he was on the perimeter a bit, you know, guarding a bit more than maybe he was in Memphis. He wasn't playing the center spot. He wasn't as available to grab rebounds. Like for instance, last year, he had his career high in rebound rate. Every other season, he's been right around 11%. Last year, he was 13%. This year, he's 10.5%. So, like, it's not a huge deal. And again, I think it's more because of the position he was playing than anything else. So, I, I'm not, like, really calling out Kyle Anderson for this. Um, but I think it's notable in a year where the Wolves, again, mightily struggled on the defensive glass. Kyle Anderson did have his career worst rebounding year. So, I, I did want to point that out. Um, overall, though, defensively, like, he was pretty plug and play. Like the wolves said, okay, our, you know, Jade McDaniels is going to guard the, the primary ball handler scoring threat on the, or I should say primary scoring threat on the wing, potentially, you know, so occasionally it was guards, but um, that was McDaniels role. Uh, some combination of Anthony Edwards and Mike Conley is going to guard the primary ball handler, depending on the night, at least late in the season, early in the season, it was, it was Daniel Russell, but um, you know, some combination of those guys are going to, are going to guard Kyle Anderson ended up being with the second unit, kind of that primary defender. You did not Jalen. You did not want Jalen Noel defending in space. If the opposing ball handler or scorer had any size, you didn't want Jordan McLaughlin defending in space. Uh, so you're relying on Kyle Anderson and his size to get through screens, to um, contest jumpers, to be able to play drop and still recover and contest shots. Like he did all of those things and was good. Um, I thought the defensive numbers overall for him were better than they were the last couple seasons in Memphis. They're still not a lot of the advanced metric numbers don't love what he does defensively, but I, I do think the eye test would tell you he's maybe a bit more effective than what some of the advanced metrics show. And again, they were better in Minnesota than they were the last couple seasons in Memphis for him individually. And I thought he was dependable and versatile on that end of the floor. Um, B-ball index. Uh, at at bball-index.com. You need a subscription to check out most of their statistics, but um, they it's what you'd expect in terms of his defensive numbers. Uh, his perimeter defense numbers, on-ball perimeter defense was pretty middle of the pack. It was a B-minus, 61st percentile, still decent in terms of his overall value was, was a plus, um, but was just kind of fine. Yet off the ball, passing lane defense, pickpocket rating, steals per 75 possessions, deflections per 75 possessions, possessions. Those are all a minuses. They're all in the eighties in terms of percentile. So really, really good off the ball, great team defense, switchable, versatile plug and play all those things. Uh, what uh, Chris Fitch before the season called Kyle Anderson, or maybe it was early in the season, the regular season called Kyle Anderson, a Swiss army knife. I, I really on both ends of the floor, but defensively, he really is that, um, now ball screen navigation. I was a little surprised to see that people index had him as a negative there. Uh, a, a C grade. Now, Jaden McDaniels is one of the best in the league at navigating ball screens. Um, Kyle Anderson got a C in that, but in every other, really every off ball category, he was really, really good and overall a positive defensively. And the defensive metrics overall, like most of the catch alls, like his defensive, um, 
for the effort he puts forth on the defensive end of the floor. The only ones that didn't really love it, like the ESPN real plus minus had him kind of, you know, barely positive. But again, he was negative last couple of years in Memphis. So in general, the defense he provided was super important to the Timberwolves, especially a shorthanded Timberwolves team for much of the season. And he missed a few games. He ended up only playing 69 games, but that's he played 69 games each of the last two years in Memphis, too. He's always kind of been around that 70 game mark um, and he had that weird illness and, and, you know, back spasms kind of bothered him throughout the year, but he was healthy for the playoffs and played when it really mattered. Um, and again, did a little bit of everything for the Timberwolves team. And, and that was super important for a team that needed that stability and that leadership. I want to talk lineup data next. There's a couple of interesting notes here um, within the lineup data. So we'll do that here next. All right, Kyle Anderson, lineup data. Um, as you might expect for a player who had such strong net rating numbers individually and advanced metrics that really appreciated what he did for the Wolves this year, the lineup metrics are very positive, or the lineup data overall is very positive when it comes to Kyle Anderson. Um, we'll start with the two-man data, and then I want to take it a layer further, as actually similar to what I did with Mike Conley um, on Tuesday. and. But to just kind of build some context, paint some context around the two man numbers. So Kyle Anderson's best two. Let's let's start here. He only had two negative two man lineups that were players that were regularly part of the Timberwolves rotation. I guess three if you include Austin Rivers. Um, you know, a few of the guys that weren't really part of the rotation: Moore, Minot, Ryan, um, Garza, Knight. Those were all negative for the Kyle Anderson two man. The only rotation two man guys, rotation guys who. Let me, let me rephrase this. The only rotation players who had negative two-man lineups with Kyle Anderson were Nas Reed, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, and Austin Rivers. The Austin Rivers one was 356 minutes. They were minus five. Uh, I don't know. We talked about Rivers already. Like He just was kind of a uh, play-when-you-need-to type of a guy. Was never... I shouldn't say never. There were stretches in the season where he was really part of the rotation. So I guess I guess that does, that does matter. Um in the 197 minutes with Nikhil Alexander Walker, which was again like just after the trade deadline, they're actually a minus 11.4, which is a little bit worrisome. Um, I think a lot of those minutes, well, again, this is one that we'd have to paint some additional context because it was probably Anderson at the four, Alexander Walker at the two. So, you know, it matters who was playing the three. Was it McDaniels? Was it somebody else? Was it Torian Prince? Um, we talked about Torian Prince. Some of his lineup data was not as favorable as you would have thought this year. So there, there's, that's this is an example of two man not being able to tell you everything, but I want to focus it on the Nas number. Nas and Kyle Anderson were minus six point nine. We talked about this with Conley. Nas and Conley were Conley's worst two man pairing. We talked about this on Tuesday show. His best two man pairing was Carl Anthony Towns. Kyle Anderson, his worst two man pairing, if you take out Alexander Walker in that smaller sample, was Nas Reed minus six point nine. His best was Rudy Gobert, a plus seven point one. Was Kyle Anderson's best two-man pairing and Towns is kind of middle. He's a plus 3.5, but everybody else for uh, effectively for, for, excuse me, for Anderson is a positive uh, two-man lineup. So what does it say about Nas Reed? I mean, like we didn't do too much lineup data when I, when I covered Nas, I think it was on Monday. Um, but this is another example of like the eye test was like, ah, oh, Nas is great this year, but some of the other numbers would suggest like, Hey, Nas had some holes defensively. Nas had some shot selection issues. Nas missed some open shots late in the season. Like it paints a little bit of a picture of also, also just how good Carl Anthony Towns is. And that was part of my conclusion on the Nas piece was, uh, or the Nas uh, discussion on Monday is it just really underscores how good Carl Anthony Towns is, especially offensively and to a lesser extent, Rudy Gobert in general. Um, again, the Rudy Kyle Anderson pairing a plus 7.1. We saw the Kyle Anderson Rudy Gobert pick and roll be one of the more successful combinations for the Timberwolves this season. Um, and, and that's absolutely the case. But then taking this a layer further, what do the three-man lineups look like? And what were the most successful Anderson and Gobert three-man lineups um, that really kind of buoyed that number? Weirdly, one of them was D'Angelo Russell. That was one of the best ones. Another one was Torian Prince. And But what I was most interested in is this Kyle Anderson 
with Gobert and Towns, Kyle Anderson at the three, or is this Kyle Anderson and Gobert with another guard? And um, indeed, the Anderson Towns Gobert three man lineup was actually a slight negative. Now they only played 76 minutes together because when Towns was healthy, Anderson usually came off the bench and typically was the sub for Towns playing with Gobert and didn't actually play that many minutes with Towns as with Anderson as a three and Towns as the four Gobert as the five. They only played 76 minutes together. They were a negative 0.6 over 18 games. Now, obviously if Towns was healthy for the balance of the, or for the remainder for the majority of the season, then we would have seen that number higher. But remember, that's not often a pairing you're going to see as much. So the whole point here is if Anderson and Gobert are such a good two-man, then that's really what matters. So like Anderson, Gobert, Torian Prince, a plus 11.5. And this is, of course, Anderson at the four, Prince at the three. Anderson, Gobert, Russell at the one was a plus 10.8. Anderson, Gobert, McDaniels at the three which is a combination we saw a ton of when Towns was out. They were a plus 9.7. That was actually his second most used three-man lineup. The most used three-man lineup was Anderson Gobert and Anthony Edwards, which was a plus 6.6. So the moral of the story here is Kyle Anderson lineups work because he's really good. Kyle Anderson at the four, like the bigger you play Kyle Anderson, or maybe a better way to say that is the smaller you play as a lineup with Kyle Anderson on the floor, the better off you're going to be. Um, and I think his best position is four because I think it uh, is the four, I should say, is, is that power forward? Because if you look at the numbers in Memphis last couple of seasons, when he was playing a quarter to a third of his minutes at the five, some of those shooting numbers, obviously the assist numbers um, all kind of dwindled a bit because he wasn't getting those opportunities. And I don't think he was being best utilized offensively. I think Kyle Anderson with the ball in his hands is an extremely effective tool. Add in the defensive capabilities, the switch ability. Um, the ability to knock down an open corner three at a 40% clip. Apparently now he's a really valuable player. You could play him in virtually any lineup. You don't really want him at the three again, because that didn't really work with, with towns and Gobert in limited minutes, but, at, and you don't love to have him at the five all that much. And the wolves don't need him at the five very much, but if he's at the four and can initiate and be that point forward for your offense, be flexible and versatile defensively. You can have him play the low man if you want. Like if you want, if Towns is in the action, Anderson can play low man, recover, contest. He's long. Um, he, he's got enough size to bother shots, uh, get out there and bother shots. If he's in pick and roll, he can play drop and bother mid-range jumpers. Um, he can press up, get through screens a little bit. Like can really do anything on the defensive end of the floor. You could say the same thing about his offensive game. I cannot say enough about Kyle Anderson. I touched on his contract at the beginning of the show, but he's obviously going to be back next year. He's he, he's getting, what, a little over $9 million in the last year of his contract. Teams were, yeah, $9.2 million. Teams were reportedly calling on him at the deadline. Obviously, the Wolves were not trading Kyle Anderson. They're not trading him next year either, unless something goes horribly awry early in the season and the Wolves can get something for him at the deadline. That's the only way he gets traded. Otherwise, he's such an important piece to what the Wolves do. Um, and... Like, again, he started 46 games this year. That wasn't the plan. The plan was for him to be effectively the sixth man, but because of the Towns injury, he ended up starting a bunch, um, which is what he did for much of his career. Last year, he he came off the bench primarily for Memphis, but expect him to be in that sixth man type role this year and be plug and play at the four, at the three, at the five, whatever he's got to do on both ends of the floor. Uh, the Wolves are going to get that from Kyle Anderson. All right, that's all we have for you today on the show. As I mentioned earlier on Thursday, we're going to talk Rudy Gobert as we continue on up the roster through the player review series. Uh, a big thank you to those that do make Locked That Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and also at my account, which is at B Beacon. With two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.